Hello. I firmly believe that they are living entities in and of themselves that survive in a dimension we just cannot see or feel, and they come to us in dreams. And it's my path in this life to give these stories a voice so they can continue to survive. I mean, with an oral tradition, that's how our stories have lived for, you know, 15,000 years or better. While Gluskomba, whose name means he who made himself, was the first of the two-leggeds to walk upon the earth. He was here before the human beings were here. Because he made himself, and Creator was quite all impressed with that, because he made himself from the leftovers of what Creator was making the world from, mm -hmm. and as he brushed the dust off his hands, that dust had the gift of life from Creator's hands still in it, and that life couldn't be negated, and everything kind of swirled and twisted around and this being was formed and became Gluskomba. So as Creator went off to do other Creator things, um, he left Gluskomba here on this earth to oversee the planet, to um, finish and refine Creator's work, to create more plants and animals as needed, and to teach the people how to live well upon the land and make sure that everyone furred, feathered, finned, and two-legged mm -hmm. Uh, cooperated with one another so that everyone could live well together. Right. And he's sort of the hero of the Abenaki people. He teaches them lessons. He plays tricks on them to teach them lessons sometimes. And over the generations, as he's taught everyone everything they can pretty much learn, he decided he was going to retire. And he took his grandmother, who's such a good cook, uh, his Nugami, and um, disappeared from the land where he's in retirement. You'll hear some people re refer to him as... Gluskop or Gluskabe. Gluskabe is actually a past tense version of the name Gluskomba, um, okay. meaning he has been but is no longer. Oh. I prefer Gluskomba because it's the present tense and he's still here. Yeah. He's still out there. Right. He's still a being in existence mm. than something of the past. To, I don't like the idea of him being a historic relic. He's such a dynamic character in the Abenaki history and pantheon of stories um, that I think it's important to keep them alive. All right, Carol, you can start whenever you want. Okay. Hello. I am Carolyn Black Hunt. I have a stroke three and a half years ago. Hello, I'm Carolyn's husband, Rick Hunt, and Carolyn um, is a renowned storyteller, and um, we performed all over New England, New York, New Jersey, um, for about a little over 10 years. Um, three years ago, Carolyn had a stroke, and because of it, she now experiences what's called aphasia, which is, um, it affects the speech part of the brain. So Carolyn is intellectually all there, but because of the aphasia, it's difficult sometimes for her to express herself verbally. Um, she's come a long way, um, and I am honored to be here today to support her in this documentary about her life and her career as a storyteller. I met Carolyn about 14 years ago after calling her um, to ask her to be a head dancer at a powwow that my cousin was putting on called Nawila. And, um, so I called Carolyn. I'd, I'd known of her in the Native community for many years, but we never really sat and talked or really met. So I, um, I called her up, and I asked her if she wanted to be a head dancer at a powwow. And she says, well, I've never done that before. And I said, well, you can learn. <laughs> so. I talked her into it, and I said, why don't we go out for Chinese food and talk? And um, yes. there's a funny anecdote that goes along with this. Carolyn was working in an office at the time, and she told her, her uh, 
coworker, she says, I can't believe he asked me out for Chinese food. And she said, don't worry about it. He's not giving you a ring. Um, <laughs> so we got together. We went out for Chinese food and chatted. And we've been together ever since. Yes. And um, Carolyn did learn how to be a head lady dancer. Um, then we were asked to go to the Rocks Estate in Bethlehem, New Hampshire. Uh, they were having a seasonal um, uh, event, and they wanted some Native American components to it. So we, we were asked if Carolyn could tell some stories, and um, we said, sure. So we went up there, and our first gig as laughing couple was um, at the Rocks Estate. I put mural paper up on the side of a barn that had ridges all over it, so it was very bumpy to draw on. But uh, people enjoyed it. The next thing, we started getting invitations to go to schools to perform. And our, f our first performance at a school was in Madbury, New Hampshire. Um, we went down there, and we had a blast. And uh, it was just terrific. So um, suddenly, people started approaching us to perform at their powwows, conferences, uh, cultural events, colleges, elementary schools, um, the Universalist Church. Uh, and eventually, Carolyn ended up doing I think nine performances with the Vermont Symphony Orchestra, yes. singing in Abenaki um, to um, folks all over Vermont. Um, and then we had um, the honor of performing with the Vermont Symphony Orchestra at the Flynn Theater. Um, they had uh, my drawing um, wall on a like a platform. And Carolyn was on one side of the stage in regalia and was singing in Abenaki to a crowd of 2,500 people plus. Um, I was standing on the platform drawing. And I looked down, and I could see violinists and a harpist and cellos and horn section. And I'm, I thought to myself, I've become the Moody Blues. <laughs> um, so since then, we have been performing all over the place. Uh, we've had some really interesting experiences. Um, our last performance was at the Flynn Theater. Right. Oh. Hello. Um, this is my old pal, Lenny Novak. Um, he is an incredible artist. Um, he does museum quality dream catchers that are like all over the place in museums and in people's private collections. And um, Chronicle in New Hampshire recently did a show on him. Um, he's, his heart is really big. And um, he is so loved by us. Um, he's going to be reading um, a story that came to Carolyn literally in a dream, full. Like, um, she got up one morning and she said to me, I just had this dream. And she started telling it to me. And I, I said, stop. You need to write this down immediately. So, what, 18 pages later, she had this traditional native story that was gifted to her in a dream. I mean, it, it came to her, and my jaw dropped after reading it. And it, she has shared it a few times in different places, uh, different venues, um, and was used a couple of times in elementary schools to deal with the theme of bullying. Um, it's called Grizzly and Black Bear. And Carolyn? It's a great honor to read this. Thank you. You ready? OK. In the long ago time, Grizzly and Black Bear did not look as they know them now. 
They were not covered with fur and they did not walk on all fours. In fact, they were smooth skinned and walked on two legs, just like the first people did and still do. And together they all shared in the bounty of the world that Creator had made. Now Grizzly, he was big and tall. He stood in a good two feet taller than the tallest men. And he was very muscular. His shoulders were very wide and his arms were very big. His hands were huge, twice the size of those of the biggest men. And he had big solid legs like tree trunks. He was bigger than his cousin Black Bear. Black Bear was as big as the biggest man, but not as big as Grizzly. And Grizzly took great pride in being the biggest and the strongest of all the two-legged. After some time, Grizzly's pride began to turn into arrogance. He began to despise the people because they were not as big and as strong as he was. And in his arrogance, he soon to, began to treat people badly. Black Bear saw this and his heart grew sad. He liked the people well enough, even though he and his cousin Grizzly were bigger and stronger. Black Bear felt bad because his cousin was treating the people badly and tried to talk with them about it. But Grizzly's arrogance was complete and he began to convince Black Bear that they were better than the people that Creator loved them more by having them bigger and stronger. And soon Black Bear began to see things through Grizzly's proud eyes. And Grizzly became mean to the people, began to do things for him so that he would not have to do them for himself. He made the people give him meat they hunted, the fish, the birds they caught. He made them give them food that they had grown and the nuts and berries they collected. The people began, became angry with Grizzly for his bad treatment of them. Their wise men and women tried to talk with him, but he closed his ears and roughly pushed them away. He often knocked the elders down with this great strength. The strongest and bravest warriors decided to fight with Grizzly to make him stop his bad behavior. But one by one, Grizzly defeated them, injuring many of them with his biggest strength. And the people became afraid of Grizzly, who had once been their friend. And enjoying the feeling of the people's fear, Grizzly's arrogance grew. He became even meaner. He became so mean that even his cousin Black Bear did not dare to speak against him. Grizzly's heart had turned black. And the people suffered under the meanness of Grizzly. He took all of their best food. He took all of their warmest furs. And Grizzly grew his fingernails very, very long to show people and Black Bear that in his superior strength, he did not have to work for anything. This made the lives of the people miserable. He made them so miserable that they held a secret meeting away from the eyes and ears of Grizzly. It was decided that they would send their best runner far to the north. This runner would go find Gluskumba, who had once said in living in the land of the ice. And so under cover of darkness, the runner went to search for Gloomskumba. The runner went to search for Gloomskavi to ask him for his help in dealing with the ways of the grizzly. The runner was gone for many moons, and while he was gone, the people suffered. Finally, nearly out of food and strength and hope, the runner found Gluskavi, and he told Gluskavi of how Grizzly, who used to be friendly in the, to the people, had become arrogant and mean. He told Gluskavi and how Grizzly roughly pushed the elders to the ground when they were told to talk to him. He told Gluskavi of the brave warriors who had fought the Grizzly to protect the people and how they failed. Upon hearing these words, Gluskavi grew sad for the people in whom he cherished, and he grew angry at Grizzly, who now thought himself better than all of the cherished other two-legged creatures. Gluskavi gave his weakened man to the care of his grandmother, Nuskumi, as he prepared for his journey. And the next morning, Gluskavi set off for the land to the south. Talking with him, the, taking with him the two wolf dogs, one white and one black. And though the runners had taken months to find him, Gluskavi had the journey south in just a few days. Upon his arrival, Gluskavi immediately went to the people, and he saw for himself the poverty and the misery of the grizzly inflicted upon the people. He saw for himself their shabby clothing and their inadequate food. Anger filled his heart after spending the night with the people. 
Buscavi went in search of Grizzly at first light. Grizzly and Black Bear were sitting in the remains of a previous night's fire. Grizzly was in a foul mood because no one of the people had come yet to awaken the fire. Black Bear knew better than to offer it to him. He did not want Grizzly to knock him down as he had done in the past. Hearing approaching footsteps in the still darkness forest, Grizzly mumbled, it is about time somebody arrived to rekindle my fire and hope he brought a lot of food because I am very hungry. I am not here for your fire, Gloomscavi said. He has stepped into the clearing, his wolf dogs following one on each side. Well, well, look who's here, cousin Black Bear. The people have sent Gloomscavi to do their bidding today. And Grizzly laughed. Black Bear did not laugh. I am not here to serve you, Grizzly. I have come to tell you that the people will no longer live in fear of you. I am here to tell you that you will no longer treat the people badly, Guscavi said quietly. Grizzly laughed, then he narrowed his eyes and said, and you think you will make this so? I will make this so, said Guscavi. Grizzly slowly rose from the hollow cedar log he had been sitting on. Then make it so, little one, he growled. Before Black Bear could even blink, Grizzly and Guscavi leapt upon one another, and as Guscavi made contact with Grizzly, he grew until he was equal in Grizzly's size and height. Equally matched, Grizzly and Guscavi engaged in a mighty battle. Black Bear was too stunned and horrified to move. As Grizzly and Guscavi fought, they trampled through the fire pit. Black soot and white ash were kicked all over Black Bear. As they fought, Guscavi grew through Grizzly from him. Grizzly came down hard upon the cedar log, breaking it. Inside the log was a huge beehive and also broke open. Grizzly and Black Bear became covered in sticky honey and cedar splinters. Guscavi again leapt onto Grizzly, knocking him and Black Bear to the ground. As they rolled onto the ground, the dry leaves stuck to Grizzly's body. Black Bear was also covered with these leaves. The battle grew more vicious. They crashed around in the clearing through the trees together. Grizzly was making loud grunting noises through all of it. Black Bear could hear Gluskavi's quiet voice. He was talking to Grizzly as they fought. These were the words he spoke. You are not worthy of the people. You are not worthy of the gifts Creator gave you in making you two-legged. Because you act like a beast, a beast you will be. As Gluskavi spoke these words, Grizzly began to change. Fur, the color of the leaves, the honey and the cedar splinters that stuck to him began to grow on his body. His arms and legs began to change. Feeling what was happening to him, Grizzly's heart grew angrier still. Who was Gluskavi to change what he was? He grew so angry that he drove his forehead into Gluskavi's chest, knocking him backwards. So hard did he do this that Grizzly's forehead was pressed flat. You have no right to punish me, he bellowed at Gluskavi. The rules people because creator made me strong enough to do so but it is not too late. The words Gluskavi had spoken went already taken effect. Grizzly looked down at his huge hands as dark brown fur grew over them. He watched as his long fingernails turned into claws. He felt his great size push him down on all fours. When he tried to speak again, all he came out of his mouth was a mighty roar. Creator made you big and strong so that you would help the people be their protector but you have chosen another way. You chose to live badly. Now you must pay the price of that choice. Gluskavi, not even breathing heavy, spoke with these words quietly. The great brown furred beast that was grizzly growled again and charged at Gluskavi. But the two wolf dogs, who had been quietly watching the fight, leapt from him. With one on each side, the wolf dogs lunged and snapped at grizzly, keeping, keeping him off balance. Grizzly's heart had now known such anger, and now it began a few twinges of fear. Knowing that he had been defeated and hating Guscavi for it, Grizzly turned and ran away. The wolf dog began to chase, but Guscavi called him back. In his anger and his shame, Grizzly ran for a long time. He ran from the place that had always known as his home. With grandfather's son behind him, he ran crossing the mighty river that split the land in two. He ran across the great open plains on the other side. He ran until he found the high mountains behind which grandfather's son 
disappeared at the end of each day. Seeing there were few people in this great open place, Grizzly stopped running. He decided that he would live here, where no one knew who he was before he became the great beast. The grandchildren of his grandchildren's grandchildren live in these remote western places still, and to this day, Grizzly is still angry that the people had called Guscavi upon him. His mood is still surely. After Grizzly ran away, Guscavi turned his eyes on Black Bear. He stood, he still lay on the ground where he had fallen. Covered in honey and leaves, cedar splinters, soot and ash, he dared not speak. Guscavi met Black Bear's fearful eyes. He knew that Black Bear was not responsible for the aggression of Grizzly's heart, but he was responsible for his own actions. He was responsible for going along with Grizzly's self-important ideas, and he was responsible for the way Grizzly began to treat the people because he did nothing to stop it. Gluskavi and Black Bear knew, both knew these things. Gluskavi and Black Bear both knew these things. They both knew that he, Black Bear, must also pay the price for his own behavior. Gluskavi raised his hands in the air, palm facing toward Black Bear, and he spoke in a soft, sad voice. These are the words he spoke. You did not honor your friendship with the people. You did not honor the gifts the Creator gave you. Because you acted as beast, a beast you must be. Black Bear felt great sadness in his heart, but he knew that he must meet his punishment with honor. He felt his fur grow on his skin. He felt his body changing. Soon the transformation was complete. No longer having the gift of words, Black Bear spoke to Guscavi with his eyes. His eyes said, I will make up for the part in this to the people. I give you my word. Guscavi read Black Bear's eyes and nodded. As Black Bear turned to go, the excited wolf dogs leapt forward for another chase. Black Bear heard their barking and climbed the nearest tree, his heart quaking with fear. Guscavi called the wolf dogs back to him. Dogs can no longer be your friend, Black Bear, Guscavi said. Creator gave them the responsibility to protect people. Because Grisby, Grizzly treated the people badly and you went along with it, dogs can now only see you as a threat. Black Bear nodded his understanding. Gluskavi returned to the people and told them what had happened. The people were happy and relieved that Grizzly was no longer around to make misery in their lives. They were also saddened that they had lost their friend, Black Bear. Some of the people were so sad about losing this special friend that they formed a family clan, the Bear Clan. Even though Black Bear did not stand in the way of Grizzly's actions, they wanted to honor their old friend. And it was the members of this clan, the Bear Clan, who sought out Black Bear in the forest. They gave him the opportunity to make up for what he had done, and make up he did. To those who came to him in a good way, Black Bear offered all that he could. Although he was now very shy, he taught those who came to him what he knew. For you see, Black Bear is one who had all the knowledge of the plant medicines in the forest. He taught his medicine knowledge to these who came to him. He held nothing back, and soon the people of the Black Bear clan became greatly known as being healers amongst the people and it became the responsibility of the Black Bear Clan to share and use this knowledge for the good of all the people. In this way, Black Bear made up for the bad choices he had made. Again, it was a great honor, even though I'm not a storyteller. <laughs> well, I'm Carolyn's aunt, and uh, of course I knew her since she was little, little. Yes. And. Uh, We've been friends and family, of course, forever. And uh, we're very much alike. We like to hike together. We spent about five years doing a lot of hiking, yes. little trail hiking. Because she would not get lost. She's great in the woods, knew the trails. Um, I, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> and Tell us a little bit about um, the family going to powwows your experience in making your own regalia? Yes, Carolyn made her dress. We'd walk on the 4th of July parade yes. because we want people to remember who was here first, who was driven to Canada with the wars, 
and um, it was just very few of us. Her sister Danielle walked with us, and we would walk from North Woodstock to Lincoln. Yes. And I would, I'm part of the Legion, so we'd walk in the beginning of the parade behind the Legion float, and yes. it was as though we were carried by the ancestors. It wasn't a, it wasn't a long walk for us, it was a spiritual walk for us. And people would look at us in different response. Some were insulting and some were honorable, but they remembered, and our ancestors were with us. You didn't always uh, recognize or were aware of some of your relatives that ended up being part of the St. Francis Sokoki right. uh, peoples. Could you talk about that a little bit? I can. It was about, oh, maybe 20 years ago. Yes. Uh, I have a relatives from Vermont, from Newport, Vermont. And Donald Nault, the name of my father, the last name of my mother, came to the house and he had the documentation of our ancestors who were traced to, to uh, St. Francis. And during the early times, they had to leave a lot of the natives, the Abenaki left the area and they went to Canada for safety. Um, in the beginning, the Abenaki were friendly and would trade with people, but they were driven out and the women and children would find safety north. So that is where they went. And that brought us to honor our heritage, yes. to walk the Fourth of July parade, to go to powwows, to dance with the drums and the sound of the drums to the earth. And it's beautiful and fun. Oh. Yes, we had a lot of fun doing that. Then, <laughs> Rick was a firekeeper at a powwow. Yes. And Carolyn told me, oh, he's got the dimples. He's so cute. We've got to go to this powwow. And so we <laughs> got all our gear and, gone, and we traveled and traveled. I said, you sure we're not lost? No, I know right where we are. So we went down and we would be in the, at the powwow where Rick was. But I don't think you talked to him then I think you uh, we asked a couple of vendors where he was but yes at that point so uh, we were sort of following Rick <laughs> 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 and uh, eventually they connected I think over in North Hero powwow because yes. he was the firekeeper and that's when Rick asked Carolyn to dance not realizing that we had been following him dancing. <laughs> so that worked out pretty well. Yes. But um, it's great here to, to honor Carolyn, her beautiful storytelling. And she could tell a story for two and a half hours, no problem, even longer. Rick would interpret the stories behind being able to draw and be in, in that moment of discovery and imagination and bring people to understand our culture, a different culture, and to honor, and it's still going on, and the Abenaki, I believe, are being recognized more and more as time passes and people look back and see a different way of life, and yes, they were here. Uh -huh. Honored and pleased to introduce our dear friend Kelly, who is going to be reading one of, uh, be reading a traditional story, uh, um, written in Carolyn's voice called "Corn Husk Girl." Um, Kelly is going to be married in about a week. To Lenny. And we're so happy for you. My name is Kelly Mowers, and soon to be Novak. And I am Micmac. And I did not know that for many years, because I live in New England. And in New England, you were told to go underground. You were not 
native because there were too many other people here that wanted you. So we did not have open tribes. We did not have open history. We did not have anything except for whisperings. Lenny Abenaki and Algonquin was told to stay with the land. We were denied even that. But I met Lenny and learned. And through the travels that we've had, and the people we have met, I found a part of me that was missing for many years. And so it's an honor to be accepted to even read a story that is tied to a belief that is deep in my heart. So thank you, Carolyn and Rick. And thank you. Carolyn, this story is amazing. It's a traditional story told in Carolyn's voice, so let me continue here. In the time when the world was young, the people were still new to life. They were still learning about how and where to gather food, about the seasons, about the birds and the animals. Sometimes they were successful with their learning, sometimes they were not. Sometimes the food they needed were not ready or did not grow when the people needed them. This meant that they had a harder time when the weather was bad and when they could not go gathering or hunting. And this made the time of the deep snows especially difficult. Often the people would go hungry, their children tucked into bed with empty stomachs. This did not go unnoticed by the spirit being of corn woman. She felt sad that the people had no way to prepare for these hard times. The hungry cries of the children made her heart weep. She felt so sorry for the people that she asked her creator if she could go down to the world and help the people. And this meant they had a harder time when the weather was bad. They could not go gathering or hunting. And this made the time of deep snows especially difficult. Often the people would go hungry, their children tucked into bed with empty stomachs. This did not go unnoticed by the spirit being of corn woman. She felt sad that the people had no way to prepare for these hard times. The hungry cries of the children made her heart weep. She felt so sorry for the people that she asked the creator if she could go down to the world and help the people. Creator agreed, and so Corn Woman left the place of spirit and became a solid being in the physical world. And as a real looking woman, she traveled from village to village to be with the people. Once the people of each village became accustomed to her strangeness as she was not truly human and began to, they began to trust her, she would call them together. Once gathered, she announced who she really was and that she had come to give them a very special gift. From the bag she carried with her on her side, she produced an ear of corn and she explained to them what it was. She showed them how to enrich the soil with fertilizers to feed the kernels of corn plants. She showed them how to plant the corn in mounds along with squash and beans to help the corn stalks grow tall and strong. She showed them how to know when the ears were ready for harvest and she showed the ways that it could be cooked. She taught them the importance of drying some of the corn each year to last them through the winter months. She also explained that some of this should be saved as seed corn so that they could grow more each year. And so she traveled from village to village to share her gift and the knowledge to go with it. When the people had learned that she, all, she, all that she could teach them about the gift of corn, it was time for her to leave them and return back to the place of spirit. But the people loved Corn Woman dearly and did not want her to leave them. However, Corn Woman could not stay. Instead, she would create a new being to live amongst the people to keep them company. And this new being would be a connection between the people and Corn Woman. And so using the discarded husk of the corn the people had eaten, Corn Woman made a new being. When Corn Woman, when, excuse me, when Corn Woman finished shaping the body, she asked the creator to breathe the breath of life into her creation. And so this new being came to life and the name given to her was Corn Husk Girl. Together Corn Woman 
and the creator instructed Cornhusk Girl how to behave while living with the people. She was to travel amongst the different villages and help the people as they needed. She was instructed to give assistance to the old ones when she saw any need and to listen to their memories for there lay the history of the people. She was instructed to spend her time with the children to help each of them, to, to help teach each of them how to live their lives. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, she was instructed to spend, she was instructed to spend her time with the children to help teach them how to live their lives with honor and to be useful members of the village, for there lay the future of the people. She was also to treat everyone equally, regardless of how they looked or how old or young they were, for any way that they may be different from others, for there lay the present time of the people. When Cornhusk Girl asked if she could accept the responsibilities as part of her gift of life, she readily agreed. Then Corn Woman introduced her to the peoples of the villages before she left herself and withdrew from the physical world. Cornhusk Girl did as she was instructed and traveled across the land and visited each village in turn. The people were happy to have Cornhusk Girl amongst them. She was especially loved amongst the children who would soon follow her all over the villages. Soon she, soon she was showing the children how to make small dolls from husks of corn. And the children always tried to draw her face upon their dolls as they thought of her as beautiful. They often told her so. Because they loved her, Cornhusk Girl was always being told of her beauty by the peoples of the different villages. The older girls even showed her how to see her reflection in puddles, pools, and other bodies of water, even in the birch bark pails they used, and Cornhusk Girl began to enjoy seeing her own face this way. Soon she began to spend more and more time looking into her own reflection and admiring the beauty of her own face. In addition, the older girls who also liked to spend time yeah. her at their own faces began to tell Cornhusk Girl that she could spend her time with them, that she was far too pretty to spend all of her time with the old ones or the little ones. She should join them admiring themselves and in teasing boys who looked, she should join them admiring themselves and teasing the boys who looked, liked to look at them. And this is what she began to do. At first, she felt guilty for walking past the old ones who were struggling with their daily chores. But the other girls told her that her time should be her own and that helping the old ones would be taken care of by someone else. The old ones would not mind as she was too beautiful for them to be angry at her. Cornhusk Girl began to believe these words and soon was not even looking at the old ones when she passed and the other girls walked past. She did not see them struggling with aching bones and weak bodies. She also felt, gu she also felt guilty about not spending in time in teaching and playing with the young ones. Again, the other girls told her that she was too beautiful to spend all of her time with such little children. Anyway, it was a responsibility of the parents to teach their own children how to be good people. She, Cornhusk Girl, should focus on herself and do what she enjoyed, spending time with the other pretty girls and teasing boys who liked to look back at them. Cornhusk Girl began to think this way and soon was shooting, shooing away the small children who wanted time to spend with her. She was too busy with the uh, older girls to notice their tears and disappointment. So guilty about the older girls that she no longer spent time with. The others told her that they were more worthy to do the task than Cornhusk Girl had been given because they did not have faces that attracted the boys. As such, they had to be more useful so that maybe someday they too would find a good husband. Cornhusk Girl agreed with this and no longer concerned herself with those girls who were not considered pretty. Corn Woman and Creator noticed this change in Cornhusk Girl's behavior and they were not pleased. She had strayed from the purpose of her life. Corn Woman decided that Cornhusk Girl needed to be reminded of why she had been made and returned to the world to pay her a visit. She waited until Cornhusk Girl was traveling between the villages before approaching her. Cornhusk Girl, she said, 
Creator and I have been watching you since the day you were brought to life. We have been watching the changes in your behaviors and are not pleased with what our eyes are seeing. You no longer see the needs of the old ones, no longer see how they struggle and get through the chores of their day. You no longer see the tears and expressions of sadness from the little ones you no longer spend time with. You no longer see the hurt of those girls you ignore because you believe they are not worthy of your attention. Instead, too much time is spent looking at the reflection of your own face. Too much time is spent with girls who feel they are too pretty to need the use of their villages. Too much value is now placed upon the features of your face and not enough on the sort of person you should be. This behavior from you is not acceptable. I urge you to forget this foolishness and return to the purpose for which you were created. You were given great privilege and responsibility by being given your life. I recommend that you return to the ways you were instructed in and leave behind your frivolities. Cornhusk girl listened to the words that corn woman spoke to her. She hung her head in shame, tears falling from her eyes. Corn woman, the words you speak are true. I have moved away from the responsibilities given to me by you and the creator. I will go forward today and return to those responsibilities with a good heart. Corn woman brushed the tears from Corn Husk girl's cheek and said, I know, what you, I know that you enjoy spending time with the older girls and the attention of the boys looking at you. There is nothing wrong with that. Indulging in it now and then will hurt no one. Just do not forget the old ones and the other children. They love you and wish to spend time with you as well. Do not disappoint them. Well, said Corn Husk girl, I promise. You're a good girl, Corn Woman told her. I know you will do the right thing. Then Corn Woman gave Corn Husk girl a hug and returned to the place of spirit. Corn Husk girl did as she was promised and spent only a little time with the older girls who liked to tease the boys. But they did not like that Cornhusk Girl was taking care of her responsibilities. Their own parents had noticed Cornhusk Girl's behavior and made comments to their own daughters that Cornhusk Girl did not place the value, place her value in her face. That Cornhusk Girl was a good example to the young ones by spending time teaching and playing with them and by helping the old ones. That Cornhusk Girl did these things of her own free will and with good heart and that she was a fine young woman to do these things without having to be asked to. Because of this, the older girls began to tease Cornhusk Girl about how only the old men were appreciating her beauty. They teased her that the boys were forgetting all about her because she was spending time with the little ones instead of with them. They were not noticing her because they spent time with the unpretty girls. At first, Cornhusk Girl laughed about these teasings, but with time, the teasing words of her pretty friends began to work their way into Cornhusk Girl's heart. She began to believe that her time again was being wasted by her responsibilities. She began to spend more and more time with her pretty friends, teasing the boys who liked to watch them. She began to feel put upon and she began spending less and less time with the other people of the village. Once more, Creator and Corn Woman noticed the changes in Cornhusk Girl's behavior. Once again, they were not pleased. Corn Woman decided that it was time to have another talk with Corn Husk Girl. She waited until Corn Husk Girl was traveling between the two villages before approaching her. When Corn Woman found Corn Husk Girl, she was sitting behind a slow moving brook, gazing over her own reflection, so absorbed. She, so absorbed was she in looking at her own face, she did not even see or hear Corn Woman approach her and jumped at the sound of Corn Woman's voice. Corn husk girl, said Corn Woman, this will not do. Oh, exclaimed Corn husk girl as she leapt to her feet. It's not what you are thinking. I was only sitting here resting my feet and I was looking at the water to watch the reflections of the clouds in the sky. I was thinking of how better to serve the people when I arrive at the next village. Corn Woman looked into the sky. It was clear and blue and unmarked by even the smallest cloud. She took a deep breath before she spoke. Corn husk girl, Creator and I have been watching you since the day of creation and accepting the life given you, you agreed to certain responsibilities. You fulfilled the responsibilities well and with a good heart for a long time, but then you began to listen to the words of only a few people and your behaviors began to change. Your heart filled with the resentment towards those you were, help, you were created to help. 
even though they continue to appreciate your actions and love you. But you forsook them to indulge in the benefits of your faith, and your faith has become more important to you than all else. The continuation of this behavior will not do. Do you understand the weight of these words that I am speaking to you? While Corn Woman was speaking, Corn House Girl hung her head low, but this time she did not cry. This time she did not feel ashamed. This time she felt annoyed at Corn Woman, but she did not let these feelings show, so she kept her head, face turned downward. Yes, Corn Woman, she responded, keeping her face averted. I understand the strength of the words you speak to me. I will try to do better when I arrive at the next village. I do not believe that you are understanding the weight of my words, Corn Husk Girl, but you must return to your responsibilities. They are far more important that, than that of having boys stealing glances at you. They are more important than the reflection of your face in still water. Your beauty cannot be more of, of more importance to you than your actions. Every action you take or do not take has repercussions. I do not believe that you are giving these repercussions any thought. It would be in your best interest to pay attention to them, for only you can change them. And failure to make these changes will have its own repercussions. Yes, corn woman, I do understand your word, corn husk girl looked up. Meeting corn woman's gaze, I will do what needs to be done. You have my word. I hope so, corn husk girl, I hope so. Corn woman stood looking at corn husk girl for a long moment, searching in her eyes. Corn husk girl did not look away, nodding her head. Corn woman stepped away and vanished back into the place of spirit. Again, Corn Husk Girl returned to her responsibilities, but this time her heart was not into it. She grew impatient with the slowness of the old ones. She quickly tired of the memories they wished to share with her. She grew weary of the constant chatter and the endless energy of the little ones and how they tried to follow her everywhere she went. She grew short-tempered with less pretty girls as they shared their feelings about other girls and the boys whose attention they could not capture. As she could think of, all she could think about was how unfair her obligations were, how she could never be the sort of, never live the sort of life that she wished for herself. She, had be, she began to feel sorry for herself. After a while, those feelings began to turn into resentment. And so, Corn Husk Girl began to create excuses for not doing her responsibilities. At first, it was only once in a while. She would slip away to a quiet place and look into her reflection, thinking of the boys who used to follow her around, hoping to catch her eye. After some time, her excuses became more and more frequent. She began to spend more and more time with the other pretty girls, teasing the boys. And she thought to herself, so what if she had agreed to her responsibilities upon her creation? She did not understand what she would have to give up for it all. It was unfair. She deserved to live her life as she chose, just like everyone else. Why couldn't she make her own decisions for how she spent her time? Everyone else could, why couldn't she? The thoughts began to fill her head, but again her behaviors did not go unnoticed. Corn Woman and the Creator had been paying close attention to the choices that Corn Husk Girl was making. They discussed at length what was to be done. Corn Husk Girl did as pro Okay, but again, her behaviors did not go unnoticed. Corn Woman and the Creator had been playing co paying close attention to the choices that Corn Husk Girl was making. They discussed at length what the consequences of her actions should be, and they decided that it should be the Creator who spoke to her this time. Again, they waited until Corn Husk Girl was between villages to address her with these concerns. When Creator found Corn Husk Girl along the path, she was standing beside a large puddle looking at her reflection. Corn Husk Girl, Creator called out softly so as not to startle her. I have come to speak with you. Corn Husk Girl looked up, her eyes glowing wide. She never expected that she would have to face Creator for her actions. Her heart began to beat fast with fear. Oh, Creator, she cried out, please tell me you are not here to unmake me. You can't do that to me. I can explain everything. Tears flowed freely down her face. Corn husk girl, Creator began in a voice both sad and soft. There is no excuse that you can give that will make excuses for your actions. You were created to take the place of corn woman amongst the people. It was your responsibility to visit and assist the old ones, as corn woman did 
before you. It was your purpose to teach the young ones the importance of thinking of the needs of others over their own wants, as corn women had done before you. You were instructed to treat everyone with equal care and love, as corn women had done before you. Two times before now, corn woman has come to you to bring you back to your purpose. Two times you have chosen to place your own wants over the needs of others. Two times you have dropped the responsibilities of your purpose to indulge the allure of your features. Two times you have given your word that this behavior would not continue, yet it has returned each time. No, corn husk girl, I will not take the breath of life back from you. Corn woman made you with love and intent, and I will not take that away from her. You are her gift to the people, and I will, deny, I will not deny that gift. However, your current behaviors can, cannot continue to happen. Your purpose must be fulfilled. As such, you have only one option left. The source of your distraction must be removed. So saying, Creator waved a hand close in front of Corn Husk Girl's face. As the hand waved past, Corn Husk Girl's features began to blur and become indistinct. Then her features were gone altogether. And so Corn Husk Girl continued to fulfill her purpose. She once again began to enjoy spending time helping and listening to the old ones. Once again enjoyed playing with and teaching the young ones. Once again she began to treat everyone with equal value value and once again she enjoyed the adoration of everyone who lived in each of the villages she visited not just the hopeful eyes of the boys she had teased in a short time corn husk girl forgot all about the loss of her beautiful face and instead lived her life with true beauty and from that day forward through all the generations the corn husk dolls that corn husk girl taught the children to make that are still being made today have remained faceless so they continue to look like the beloved corn husk girl. I'd like to claim that I wrote this. I didn't so much write it as I copied it down from what I remembered in my dream, but it came to me in its entirety. It's been a great story this year. We've, it's gotten a lot of uh, playtime, I should say, because because of the themes of the story about responsibility to others and how you treat others, um, especially where awareness right now in, in public schools and elementary schools is about bullying. We asked some of the kids um, at a school we were at in New York, you know, how many kids had been subjected to um, the behaviors that one of this character displays to the other characters in a negative way. And and uh, we were really surprised to see how many hands went up. And, and I was looking around at some of the teachers, and they were kind of surprised, too, uh, how many hands had come up. Um, so we thought that this would be a timely story uh, for awareness of bullying. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing that story I love this us. story, and I'm so grateful that it was given to me to share it with people. Uh -huh. Um, the first time we told it, last August, we were at a powwow, and I introduced the story for the first time, and I had Ben coming up to me. Ben, I didn't know. <laughs> Complete strangers coming up and saying, my God, what an intense story. You made me cry. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't think a storyteller can get a better compliment than that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, well, good for you. Thank you so much thank for you. joining us today. Oh, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and share with you again. Yeah. It's great fun to do so. Oh, it's really great to have you yeah. both here. <laughs> Surprising, they really identify with coyote. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we, you know, it's like, well, what do you think about coyote's behavior? Well, yeah, he shouldn't have done this, but this is why he did it. They always have an excuse for coyote. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> but they, they do learn, you know, when you ask them, you know, what do you think? about what Coyote did. Oh, well, he was absolutely wrong. So why do you think he was wrong? Well, he was wrong because of this. But this is why he did it. And it's like, well, do you think that made it okay? Well, no, but he, you shouldn't punish Coyote. He's just a dog anyway. Aww. So yeah. they always come to his defense. But they, they understand the story, and it touches them in the heart, Yeah. Um, which is what the stories are supposed to do, because right. that's how they get remembered. Right. And then, you know, and as I tell the kids, you know, as, as the stories touch you and they stay with you, and someday, you're going to tell this story to another child, or to your own child, yes. or to a grandchild, or even to your parents mm -hmm. or grandparents. That makes you a storyteller, too. Right. And that's how the stories have survived. You know, yeah. our, our people have been here, you know, according to um, 
the archaeologists, we've been here for 12,000 years. According to us, we've been here forever. We were put here specifically by Creator. This is where we were supposed to be. This is why we're here. Um, and we didn't have written language the way that the Europeans have written language. We didn't have um, an alphabet. And the way the stories were continued was one one person to another. They were yes. the school. They were the education of the people. Mm -hmm. They taught the people how to be and how not to be and how to live well with one another. Mm -hmm. And examples like coyote were, you know, why you shouldn't misbehave and what happens because of it. And because the stories are passed on from one person to the next because it's touched them in the heart, the stories live. Yes. You know, and the stories are just out there right. waiting to have a voice. And I've I've been blessed and honored to be chosen to be that voice, oh, to be yeah. one of the voices. Yeah. So I try to honor that as well as I can, and I have a lot of fun with it. And, and it's a, we've always been well-received everywhere we've gone because people, people want to hear stories. And it's funny because, we, especially in the schools, um, I think sometimes the teachers get more engrossed in the stories than the kids do, yeah. <laughs> I love which is them. wonderful. Like that. Yeah. It, it reminds me so much, too, of using music in that mm -hmm. way, of, of yes. sharing uh, stories and feelings and mm -hmm. and uh, I know music is a healer and can bring you change your moods and yes rise up your energy and it's just yeah. wonderful and yeah. you, you do s this <laughs> same thing with storytelling thank I, you I really love it 